Hi everyone, this is the video that goes with chapter one um, of our textbook, um, the sort of introductory chapter that goes over some big theories, talks about research methods, always exciting for everybody. Um, and so I wanna go over just a few of the highlights, a few of the sticky points um, that sometimes people have um, a little bit more trouble understanding, um, especially in the beginning of a semester, um, but I'm not gonna go through all the slides. So the slides um, that I've posted for you to look at that, that pretty much go along with the chapter and, and some of the highlights there, um, I'm not gonna use those exactly here, but I will touch on just a few of those. Um, so um, one thing to keep in mind is um, chapter one, and actually the first two or three chapters are the most challenging of the semester. So if you're finding it a little bit hard to apply things, a little bit harder to recall things um, after you've read them, don't be surprised. Um, when you get into adolescence, you can probably remember being an adolescent, or maybe you still are an adolescent. Um, you know, so some of the things that are more applicable to you, you'll be able to internalize much more quickly. You'll also, by that point, have a language that goes along with um, the field. Um, and so you'll have um, categories and, and ways to organize the, the information in your own mind um, that makes it more facilitative. Um, so just keep in mind that it's a little tough in the first couple of chapters. Um, the other thing I want to point out is in this um, in this course, we're going to be talking about typical development. Um, so we really won't spend very much time at all on anything that's atypical or what you would consider um, abnormal development in some way, um, psychological disorders. We're really not going to touch on those um, because unless we understand typical development, it's hard to know what the borders are between typical and something that might be um, worthy of our attention because it doesn't seem to be what most people are doing at that age or in those circumstances. You know, when you think about um, for, for toddlers, infants and toddlers, you know, when do they start walking? If you don't know when about half of kids start walking and what the range is, it would be hard for you to know whether a child was early, um, whether they were a little bit late, or whether it's something that you ought to talk to a pediatrician about um, because it's concerning. Um, so um, throughout the semester, we'll be talking mostly about typical development, also mostly about cognitive and psychosocial development, and relatively little on physical development. Having said that, in the first couple of chapters, we are going to talk a lot about physical development because the difference between a six-month-old child and a 16-month-old child is dramatic. The difference between a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old in a physical sense, not quite so dramatic, which is not to say that things don't change, but uh, we only have 16 weeks. We've only got a few hours a week, um, and so I would like to focus most mostly on the things that are that are most firmly rooted in psychology would be which would be cognitive and psychosocial development um, this chapter will go over some of the big theories. In this video, I'm not going to really talk about those. I will talk about one of them. Um, it may largely be a review of what you remember from introductory psychology, um, and it may not be. You know, there may be some theories here that you haven't seen before or need a refresher on. So you'll know how much time to spend on those theories. As they come up across the semester, we're going to talk, initially we'll be uh, focusing mostly on Piaget and Vygotsky. Um, for cognitive development and psychosocial development, mostly Erickson, um, but we will bring in other theorists. When we get to um, the end of adolescence, beginning of adulthood, um, Piaget didn't have a theory for um, for the rest of the lifespan. So, you know, some theories are lifespan theories, some are not. Um, and Piaget's theory in particular uh, was a theory that went up through adulthood, and he didn't really have a theory that followed you throughout the end of life. Um, but other others did, like Erickson. Um, so as we get to those chapters, we'll be pulling in some more current theories um, that build on Piaget and build on some of the other theorists, uh, but go off in a different direction. Um, and then lastly, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about um, uh, research methods, um, not in great detail, because I think you're probably familiar with the basics of research, um, and also you'll you'll be picking it up along the way. But there are a couple of things that we talk about in developmental psychology quite a lot, um, and so I'll touch on those. The first question, so let me get into it. Um, the first question to think about as you're uh, working through chapter one is, what is development? Um, and that seems like a relatively simple question, um, but you know, in graduate school, in a developmental program, you might spend an entire class period, you might just spend three hours talking about what do we mean by development? Um, because it's not quite what everybody initially thinks. Um, so in the slides, there's a um, there's a multicolored graph that I really like, or you know, line chart, whatever, um, uh, that uh, that depicts different 
aspects of development or different ways to think about development. And one of them is the behaviorist view of continuous development. Um, and that's depicted in the slide by a blue line, you know, starts out low, and then every day you learn a little bit, grow a little bit, change a little bit, um, and growth is linear in some way. It might not be a straight line straight up, but, um, but it's linear in some way and everything builds on the day before. There's nothing wrong with that, um, but that's not the way we usually talk about development in a lifespan course um, because we find some of the other ways of thinking about um, development to be um, to be more inform informative is probably the wrong word, but um, more useful for for having a discussion and, and and having a common understanding of what it is we're talking about. Um, if there's no change across the lifespan and there's some aspects of your of your development that are relatively stable, that would be depicted by just a straight line straight across. Um, what most people think about when they think about um, lifespan development is that there's it's a sort of a curve that you're building, 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 you get to midlife, you plateau, and then everything else is a downhill curve to the end of life. Um, and that is one way of thinking about it. And there are, there are some aspects of development that seem to follow that, but there are a lot that don't. And so when we get to midlife, we'll talk about the things um, that continue to grow and the other things that start to decline and when they start to decline. And in particular, when they just start to decline in a really precipitous way, where there's a steep decline. Um, so that's another way of thinking about it. Um, some grow, some um, development seems to be relatively unpredictable, um, and so it's sort of a you know a chaotic line of of you know things get better, things get worse. Um, that's not really what we're going to talk about in this course because we're going to be talking about typical development. And the one that we're going to spend the most time on is depicted by a green line that looks like it stair steps up. Um, and what that is, is, is um, development in stages, growth in stages. <clears throat> um, and when you think about a stage, it isn't that you, you enter, say, the stage of adolescence and you're an adolescent and then one day you're an adult. Um, there is change. So there is that day to day change. But when you talk about um, different aspects or different um, periods of the lifespan, it can be useful to bucket them into stages. So if I invite you to a party and I say uh, the party is on Saturday from three to six and it's going to be at the pool, it was like, you know, that might be all you need to know. But if I told you it was going to be all teenagers, you would have an idea in your head about what that party would look like. If I told you it was going to be all toddlers, you would have a different idea. And so that idea of having stages helps us to, um, to sort of say, when does that stage start and stop? What happens within that stage? And let's talk about that stage before we move on to the next stage. So we'll spend a fair amount of time there. Uh, but again, you know, when you're defining development, it is growth, but it's also loss, right? That those losses at the end of life are also part of development. And so when you take a lifespan perspective, um, that's what that's what we're going to be doing. Um, I also want to point out that um, if you took this course at UNC Chapel Hill or some other four-year institutions, um, very often it's a child development course. And then if you're still in the psychology program and you want to take more courses, you take adolescent development, you take adult development. Um, this is a lifespan course. So um, a lot of people need this course for uh, if they're going into some health-related field, um, it, you know, pre-nursing students, for example, um, often take a lifespan course. Um, if you wanted to go into occupational therapy, you might be expected to take a lifespan course. Um, but it used to be when we talked about developmental psychology, it really was just child development. And when you got to adolescence, you know, sort of think back to what I just said about Piaget, um, you were done, right? You, you made it through adolescence, you got to adulthood, and then that was it. Like things, you know, you just got more so for the rest of your life. And then there was some loss. Um, so for us, it's not just a course in child development. We're going to look at every stage of the lifespan. You could divide up the lifespan in different ways. Um, you know, if you took our course in another culture, um, maybe they maybe they would have a period of adolescence. Maybe not. Maybe they would have a period of um, emerging adulthood. Maybe not. Um, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, emerging adulthood wasn't even a thing um, for us um, studying developmental psychology in the United States. So it's very much um, a, sort of a, a constructed. Uh, view of how to divide up the lifespan, where are those important divisions, and if you were tasked with making those divisions, you might make a different decision than the textbook author, for example, but um, our textbook follows a pretty standard, uh, pretty standard view. 
Okay. Um, one of the things that's talked about in the textbook is um, are the contextual influences. So um, normative age graded um, influences, normative history graded um, influences, and non-normative life events. In one of the assignments uh, for this unit, um, I asked you to do a developmental timeline, or I'm asking you to do a developmental timeline, so you'll need those definitions. Um, Age-graded influences are things that are normative, happen to almost everybody at around the same time. Not, I, you know, not 100% of the time, but when you think about um, things that influenced you, you know, um, being independent, getting your first job, um, learning to drive a car, um, graduating from high school, you know, if you did any of these things, a lot of people did it at the same age. Not everybody. I mean, I remember as a young adult meeting somebody who was in their 50s and was getting a driver's license for the first time. Um, you know, for me, I was really surprised. For them, they had lived in New York City their whole life and driving really wasn't a thing. You had to be incredibly affluent to afford a car and be able to afford to maintain a car in a city like that. Um, so it just, you know, it was a very different kind of a thing. But a normative age graded influence is it happens to most people at around that age. Um, normative history History graded is um, there, there are aspects of history that happen to all of us, regardless of what age we are. So um, if there's a big um, uh, environmental event, um, if there's a war, any of those things happens to all of us at the same time, it affects us differently depending on how old we are. So the understanding that a five-year-old might have of a tornado hitting their um, their community is very different than the experience and remembrance that a 15-year-old would have or a 50-year-old would have because they have different uh, different ways of experiencing it, different concerns. Um, so that would be normative history graded. Um, and then non-normative life events are things that don't happen to most people. Um, it does They don't have to be bizarre, um, but they don't happen to most people. When you think about a broken bone, if you've ever had a broken bone, it's not shocking to hear that somebody at one point in their life had a broken arm or had a broken leg, but most people haven't. Um, and uh, you don't you know, say to somebody, hey, what, how old were you when you got your broken leg? Um, because most people don't have it. So non-normative life events don't happen to most people. Um, but again, they don't have to be bizarre. Um, so um, when you're thinking about it, um, sometimes it's hard to know whether something is age graded or non-normative um, because it happens to a lot of people, right? Um, what about something like divorce, being a child of divorce? Um, you know, that that seems like it happens to a lot of people at a certain time, but it doesn't happen to everybody, right? So is it non-normative? Um, again, it doesn't have to be bizarre to be non-normative. Um, another um, way that they're um, making some distinctions in this chapter um, is to think about different ways of thinking about age. <clears throat> um, chronological age is you know, your birthday. How many birthdays have you had? Um, so chronological age is what we really think about when we think about how old somebody is. But then there are different aspects of aging, um, particularly as people get older, biological age can be a factor. You know, if you take your average 50 or 60 or 70 year old, it can be hard to know how old somebody is just based on looking at them because of biological factors that may or may not be under their control. Many of them are not under their control. Um, so people age differently depending on what those health concerns are um, in their life. Um, psychological aging, you probably know people who um, act younger than they should or act older than they should. Um, I definitely know some adults that you know seem to have the reasoning capacity of a nine-year-old um, in certain aspects of their life. So you may as well, maybe not, I hope not. Um, so uh, actually I like those people, so I wouldn't say I hope not. Um, but um, psychological age is sort of how you're dealing with those kinds of things. And some people seem to be uh, quite mature for their age and some people less so. Um, and then social age, um, the different kinds of roles that you take on and how that affects you. So, you know, that sort of um, parent status, grandparent status, um, you know, uh, committed partner status. Um, some of those things happen to people, some of them don't, but um, those can affect how we think about people as well. Um, and then patterns of aging. Um, normal aging is just sort of what you would, would expect, um, typical development, typical aging. Pathological aging is when things go wrong. Um, and so when you think about what happens at the end of life, if what you're thinking about is a decline in health, a decline in mobility, a decline in strength, um, that's pathological aging. And so most people hope that it won't happen to them. A certain amount of it is inevitable. For some people, it's more precipitous than others. So um, that would be pathological aging. And then successful aging, we'll talk about way, you know, Know, towards the end of the semester, um, we'll talk about um, different uh, ways that people age, um, some of which seem to be um, quite um, adaptive um, and others less so. And so we call that successful aging. Um, when you think about the significance of age, you know, think about 
um, you know, is there a best age? Like if you could pick any age to be, what age would you pick? Um, and a lot of people would pick an age that they are or have already been. Um, you know, would you pick 75? Well, probably not, but 75 year olds might pick that. Would you pick 25? Um, perhaps, but a lot of 50 year olds would say, hey, I worked really hard to get through 25 and I don't want to go back and do that work again. Um, so it sort of depends on where you are in the age, uh, in the sort of age continuum, uh, what you would think the best age is. Um, and so that may change for you. But I mean, I think it's worth thinking about as we're starting out in this course, um, what you think. Um, and then when's the, you know, when we talk about normative age graded influences, when's the right time to do things? You know, what are the expected ages in our culture, in your culture, um, for, um, have, you know, being independent, um, having a, a partner, if you're going to, um, getting a job, um, you know, starting out on a career, um, when do you expect your career to peak? Um, you know, when do you expect to retire? And what do you think that that will look like? Um, so when you think about the timing of those things, those are aspects of development and um, developmental influences that we'll talk about all throughout the rest of the semester. Okay, um, theories of development. Um, I talked a little bit about Piaget and Erickson. Um, so psychoanalytic theories, Erickson, cognitive theories, uh, we'll start out with Piaget. Behavioral and social cognitive, we'll talk a little bit about behaviorism um, and Vygotsky. Um, ethological theory, sort of, um, you know, looking at the biological influences, um, and then ecological. Um, and for ecological, um, um, I'd like you to focus on or, or pay attention to Bronfenbrenner's model. Um, it's used quite a lot in developmental psychology. It's a complicated model, um, and it, you know, you can look at it and say that makes sense. And then if you turn your back and say, let me talk about what each of those systems are and define them and explain them to somebody else, it can be quite difficult. Um, your microsystem or the microsystem is how the individual is interacting with lots of things. So if the individual is front and center um, in, in one aspect of development, that would be their microsystem. They interact with their parents, they interact with their friends, they interact with their teacher. Um, you know, it's the person having all of these interactions. And, and this theory, by the way, is sort of trying to explain why you are the way you are, why somebody is the way they are. So part of it are the interactions that they had in their microsystem. Um, then when you talk about the exosystem, you know, you're talking about, you know, what, you know, what are the neighbors like, you know, what's the neighborhood like, friends of the family, things that the person doesn't directly control or directly interact with, um, but they're part of that person's life. Um, so that would be their exosystem. The macro system is the larger culture that they're being raised in um, and, you know, sort of, you know, how that's impacting um, or constraining or expanding um, what their opportunities are and what their experiences are. The meso system is how these things are interacting with each other. Um, and so that's where it starts to get pretty complicated when you start to think about this model. Um, and then the chrono system is there's a passage of time, right? As all of these things are happening, the individual is getting older, um, the world is changing, the culture is changing, things in their neighborhood might be changing. And so all of these things are changing as development is occurring. So the Bronfen Brennan model is a complicated one. I would encourage you at you know, at different points throughout the semester to maybe go back and refer back to it and sort of think about that and think about whether that's the theory of everything that you'd like to use to explain development and how it works to somebody who hasn't taken this class. Okay, um, very briefly on research methods. Um, research methods in developmental psychology follow many of the research, same research um, paradigms that you'd use in other aspects of psychology. We can do observations, we can do questionnaires, we can do experiments, we can do all of those kinds of things. Um, it can be hard to figure out why somebody is the way they, why they are the way they are, um, because it depends, and it depends on a lot of factors. When you think about something like birth order, um, do you think older children, middle children, younger children, only children are different as a function of their birth order? Um, and a lot of people do. Like, it seems to make sense when you talk to people and you find out that they're the oldest child, you're like, oh, I get that. That makes sense. Um, or you find out that they're an only child or somebody in your group um, says that they're a middle child. It's like you have some sort of a stereotype that you activate about what um, what that birth order uh, confers, uh, what, what information that, that confers for you. 
Um, that can be really hard to study. Um, when you think about studying birth order, you can't just ask people, are you the oldest, youngest, middle only? Um, you have to also ask them, what's the age distance between you and the next sibling if you had a sibling? Because um, the oldest child was an only child for a while. Maybe they were an only child for 10 years. Maybe they were an only child for two years and don't even remember it. Um, so the difference between those ages matters as well as what their actual status is. Um, the youngest child may felt have felt like an only child because there was so much distance between them and their next sibling that they essentially spent most of their formative years um, being the only child in the home. And so, you know, what if uh, what if you uh, were being raised by um, relatives or somebody other than your biological parents? Um, at what point did you uh, did you uh, gain that status? And what impact did that have? So the birth order is one thing that you can talk about, um, but it can be really hard to study. And so when you look at the research on birth order, very often you find very small effects of birth order because of those constraints on the research. So that's just a long way of saying um, the research method matters. You know, when you're evaluating research, if you see something, and I know I did when I took this course for the first time, if you read something and you say, I don't think that's how that works. I don't think that's what single parents are like. I don't think that's what adolescents are like. Look up the research and look at how they did it. You know, who did they ask? How did they do it? Did they observe people? Did they ask them to say what they think they would do or what they were actually doing um, or what somebody else said that they did? All of those things really matter. So, um, so I would encourage you, um, whenever you've got a question like that, to challenge the thinking that's in the book um, and look up that research. Um, sometimes, even if you just read the abstract, it might be the only thing that you can get for free. Um, but I, very, every time I read this, this textbook, including yesterday, I'll be reading something and there'll be a parenthetical reference at the end of a sentence. And I was like, I wonder, you know, where, where'd they get that from? And I'll look in the back of the book and look up the title of the article um, and then Google it. And I'll get to read the abstract. I might not have access to the full text, but the abstract will tell you a little bit about how they did the research. And then if you still have questions and you still can't get the article for free, um, send me an email and I can uh, see if I can find um, a copy of it for you for free. Um, um, cross-sectional research, longitudinal research, your book talks a little bit about that, and then I'm going to wrap it up, I promise. Um, cross-sectional research um, is, um, is relatively straightforward to do. You could design a study today and, and compare 10-year-olds and 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds and see how they're different on some question that you had, uh, perhaps memory. Um, you know, you're interested in how memory changes. Um, and so you compare them and you say, oh, okay, well, the 10-year-olds are better or worse than the 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, whatever it is that your research question is. Um, so that's a research project that you could do this semester um, comparing those different age groups. The problem with that um, is that you're assuming that today's 10 year olds and today's 40 year olds, that the only difference in them is age. And that if these 10 year olds were 40, they would be like the 40 year olds. And that's not true, right? Um, 30 years go by and the world changes, education changes, expectations change, um, nutrition changes. So so there are all kinds of changes that you're ignoring there. You're assuming that the only differences between your groups is age. Um, and so that's one of the drawbacks. One of the benefits is um, that it's relatively straightforward to do and it's um, economical in terms of both money but also in terms of time, um, because you can do it. Um, and it's often a good first step. Um, longitudinal research takes much longer to do. You take a group of 10 year olds and you follow them for 30 years. That's great, but what if at the end of 30 years you find out that your hypothesis wasn't supported and you didn't find any differences, well, um, you've just spent 30 years on that. Do you have another 30 years to come up with a new research question and do that? You've spent a lot of time. So that's relatively expensive in terms of time and resources. Um, so um, longitudinal research is sort of, it's great if you can follow people and you can see the uh, within individual change across that time rather than between groups, um, but it takes a long time to do. So what researchers have done in developmental psychology is adopted very often a cross-sequential approach, not always, but a cross-sequential approach um, does that cross-sectional research. And then, you know, maybe seven years later, I'm referring to the Seattle Longitudinal Study, or I'm thinking of it, um, and we'll talk about it later in the semester. Seven years later, you um, study those people again, so you get to see the longitudinal change, but you also add in another cohort of people. So you started with 500 people maybe, seven years later, you test them again, but then you get a new group of 500 people so that you can do cross-sectional studies. You can do longitudinal because you were following them across time from time one to time two for group one. For group two, you know, in year 14, they'll have a second time of measurement. Group one will have a 
third time of measurement, and so on. So the Seattle Longitudinal Study was every seven years. Um, and then each time they added a new uh, new cohort so that they could do cross-sectional. Um, but the other thing that they could do is they could say, okay, we had 25-year-olds in, you know, in the first time of measurement. Then we added more 25-year-olds. So we can see what's the difference in, in how 25-year-olds are developing from, you know, from this first time of measurement and then every seven years after that. So when you ask yourself, are today's 20-year-olds different or the same as the 20-year-olds of the 1970s, this is the kind of research that will show you that. So um, it's cross it's um, it's both cross-sectional and longitudinal. We call it cross-sequential. It goes across these sequences. Um, okay, um, that's it uh, for this chapter. Um, if you've got any questions, let me know and um, have a great, um, you know, great week um, working through this material. Um, and uh, yeah, let me know if, you, if I can do anything for you. Thanks. Bye.